Welcome. Today we're talking about cultural rebirth. The Great Mortality fundamentally altered the social fabric of Western Europe. For those who lived through it, plague brought incomparable suffering, and it left the cultures and societies of Europe with only one viable option, to rebuild and be reborn. Nowhere is more associated with rebirth than 15th century Italy. Its incredible art shows a deep appreciation of ancient Rome and ancient Greece. But more than anything, rebirth was about Christian society as a whole. The English word Renaissance simply means rebirth. At the time, Italians used the word rinascita, that is, rebirth, to describe cultural developments. But no one described current events as the Renaissance with a capital R. We have come to think of 15th century Italy as a discrete time period with a clearer outline of features than those at the time would have recognized. Some might say that this is natural because hindsight is 2020. But, sorry, hindsight really isn't clear at all. There's a more complicated history behind our own ideas about cultural rebirth in 15th century Italy. Jakob Burkhardt's book, The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, is perhaps the most influential study on point from the last 200 years. Writing after the revolution of the late 18th and mid 19th centuries, Burkhardt came to view 15th century Italy as the birthplace of modern, secular, and scientific values. The great patrons of art appeared to him as self-made men, and because their lifestyles were sometimes far from Christian ideals, Burkhardt saw them as fundamentally secular figures. But this raises a question. If the people were so secular, why was their art so religious? Clearly, a better explanation is needed. Our story really begins in 1420, when Pope Martin V returned to Rome. The Council of Constance had concluded in 1418, and with the great schism of the previous 40 years now over, the papacy had come home. But the Pope found Rome in dilapidated condition. Many people had deserted the city, and churches lay crumbling. The only solution was to literally rebuild. Beginning with very practical reasons, Martin V unwittingly set in motion what became one of history's greatest periods of architectural and artistic innovation. However, the rebuilding of Rome often incorporated signs of papal authority. This was a direct response to the councils of the early 15th century, but especially to the Council of Basel, which had ended in schism. For some contemporaries, the failure of Basel only showed that the authority of councils was not a viable way forward for the church. Under papal direction, Rome was thus restored as a cultural center, but it was also a kind of argument in stone that this was the spiritual center of the Christian world. Because art is so important for this time period, we're going to look at three paintings, and all of these paintings point to an important cultural function of the 15th century papacy that is, as a patron of the arts. Our first painting is Christ Consigns the Keys to St. Peter by Pietro Perugino. Located in the Sistine Chapel, Perugino began working on it in 1480 and completed it two years later. The painting was part of a larger series of paintings in the Palatine Chapel. But today this chapel is known as the Sistine Chapel because Pope Sixtus IV had it rebuilt and redecorated between 1475 in 1482. With the chapel reconstructed, it was also renamed after the Pope who gave it its current form. At a basic level, Perugino's painting relates a story from the New Testament. In the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus tells Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Until the latter 16th century, all Christians believed that this passage referred to priestly authority, specifically the sacrament of confession. 
However, Catholics have an additional understanding of this passage. They believe that the keys of the kingdom of heaven also refer to papal authority. And so, coming after 15th century councils that challenged papal primacy, Perugino's painting illustrates both a basic Bible story and an interpretation deeply rooted in Catholic history, and one that was given renewed force and meaning after the councils of Constance and Basel. But of course, not everything was about politics. Much Renaissance art was deeply invested in culture and in intellectual life. Here is the School of Athens by Raphael, who painted it in the Papal Palace. So here too we have a Papal Commission, and the Pope in question was Julius II. The School of Athens features a number of philosophers from ancient Greece. At the center are the two greatest philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. Looking more closely, we see that Plato points up at the heavens. This symbolized his view of truth, that it depends ultimately upon the divine and transcendent. But Aristotle reaches out. This symbolized his view that truth is found in the natural world around us. Plato's view was more spiritual, Aristotle's more empirical. Their difference is further driven home by the books they hold. Plato carries his work, the Timaeus. Aristotle carries his work, the Ethics. Plato's Timaeus was a dialogue about the origin of the world. It holds that Earth, although imperfect, is based upon the divine ideal of a fundamentally good deity. But Aristotle's was about how to live in the world. Aristotle did not rely upon divine ideals, but upon the study of nature. Our last artistic selection is actually a series of paintings, and it returns us to the Sistine Chapel. It also returns us to Pope Julius II, who this time commissioned Michelangelo. These paintings follow the biblical book of Genesis, in which humanity falls from grace, but which in Christian thought is then immediately promised eventual redemption. But there is something odd here. Michelangelo's narrative actually happens in reverse. The first picture shows Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden. The second picture shows an earlier event, the creation of Eve. The last picture shows two beginnings, the creation and redemption of humanity. The narrative across these paintings is twofold, the relationship of Eve to Mary and the relationship of Adam to Christ. We know that these three scenes belong together, because zooming in more closely, we see something important. Eve is pointing, and when her fingers direct our vision, we see the narrative unfold. The first scene shows the fall of humanity from grace. Two things are worth noting. First, who is reaching for the fruit? It's Adam, not Eve. Eve's body is turned away. She appears almost passive toward temptation, this is unlike Genesis, in which Eve sins before Adam. Perhaps Michelangelo was drawing upon the Apostle Paul, who wrote in the New Testament that humanity sinned in Adam. Let's look again at Eve's fingers. She's pointing to the next scenes, but she is also pointing to her vulva. And this is not just sexual, it's theological. Here Michelangelo followed a long tradition of Catholic biblical interpretation, which held that the story of humanity's fall also pointed toward redemption. The next scene shows the creation of Eve. So again, this sequence is working backwards through the biblical narrative. Look at Eve's hands. It looks like she's praying. This is a posture of piety. You might even say it seems more like Mary than Eve. Now look at Adam. He is sleeping next to a dead tree. Here again, we see a diverse fusion of images. No dead trees are mentioned in the book of Genesis, but in the New Testament, the cross of Christ is described as a tree. It's helpful to turn again to the Apostle Paul. Paul describes Jesus as the second Adam. So here, in this painting, the first Adam, sleeping next to a dead tree, points forward to the work of Jesus as the second Adam. Taken together, this scene shows two things. On the one hand, it's the creation of Eve out of Adam, and Eve in a state of spiritual purity. Therefore, and on the other hand, Eve points to something more than herself. She points to the creation of the Christian church, which came from Jesus, just as Eve came from Adam. 
In the last scene, we work backwards even further. Here we have the creation of Adam. God, reaching out, gives Adam life. But more importantly, keep in mind the first scene. Following the direction of Eve's fingers, we see that she is pointing not toward Adam nor even at God. Rather, she points directly at the shoulder of the young woman next to God. Here is a close-up of the young woman in question. Given her placement between God and the infant, this is obviously Mary. Note that Mary looks exactly like Eve. Following Catholic tradition, Michelangelo understood Mary as a second Eve. The technical word here is recapitulation. It's an old Christian idea that goes back to at least the second century. Recapitulation holds that the order of salvation reverses the order of humanity's fall. We see elements of this idea in the Apostle Paul's description of Jesus as the second Adam. But Jesus came from Mary, which is the exact opposite of how Eve came from Adam. So, reversing the order of the fall, Mary is a kind of second Eve. From the second Eve comes the second Adam. But how do we know that this woman is in fact Mary? The answer is literally right next to her. God holds the baby between his thumb and index finger. The posture of the fingers is intentional. This is exactly how priests held the bread of communion, between the thumb and the index finger. In Catholic tradition, the bread and wine of communion are believed to be the literal body and blood of Christ. So, the position of God's fingers indicates this child is the baby Jesus. Therefore, the woman next to him is both Eve and Mary. Redemption is recapitulation. The order of creation is, in some sense, reversed, and thus creation is recreated. So what? At the beginning of today's episode, I pointed out that history has a history. That is, we think of 15th century Italian culture differently than contemporaries did. And that brings us to a key term, historiography. Historiography literally means the writing of history. You might also describe it as the history of history. That is, the history of how history is written. Over time, how we write history changes. Hopefully, it improves. Hopefully, we identify the biases of past generations and offer a better understanding. It is now generally recognized that Renaissance Italy was heavily informed by Christian ideals. This does not mean that all people were simply good little boys and girls. There is plenty of salacious material that could be offered about popes and painters and about patrons and princes. But if we want to think more seriously about history, we have to think about historiography. And in the present case, we need to ask, how did people like Jakob Burckhardt read their own values back upon the 15th century? At least some of the answer has to do with 19th century European politics. Burckhardt wrote after the revolutions of 1848, which were to some degree inspired by the French Revolution, which began in 1789. It is not uncommon that those who write in the wake of a revolution try to find its origins in the deeper past but this often results in projecting revolutionary values upon that same history. Individualism and secularism were major developments in the 19th century. It is familiar but fanciful to find their origin in 15th century Italy. If you're interested in learning more about Renaissance history, these books are worth consulting. First is Martin Ruhl's volume the Italian Renaissance and the German Historical Imagination, 1860 to 1930. He helps explain why so many people came to believe that the Renaissance enabled secularization and individualism. Our second book is by Lauren Partridge, The Renaissance in Rome. It is an excellent and heavily illustrated overview of painting and sculpture and their intersection with religion and politics. Finally, is Gary Anderson's study, The Genesis of Perfection, Adam and Eve in Jewish and Christian Imagination. If you enjoyed our discussion about the Sistine Chapel, Anderson's book is the one for you. That's all for now. Thanks so much for watching. Please hit the subscribe button. Feel free to leave a comment, and I'll see you next time.
Memento mori, memento mori, memento mori.